good evening friends a warm welcome from ccai for this meeting today which is talk to talk about how to do a good meeting so that's the topic today we'll talk about workshops as the title indicates but we'll also go into various facets of meetings that you visit on a regular basis you are a part of on a regular basis to do this today to talk to all of you today discuss with all of you today we have a wonderful panel the panel includes youngsters people like yourself who have done meetings participated in meetings and also been delegates at various meetings and listened in and they'll share with us what their queries are their suggestions are about how to go about doing a good meeting the input would include what they expect from the faculty when they go to a meeting as a listener and obviously their inputs about how they feel about being faculty and what are the various facets on which they concentrate when they go and speak at meetings or become a part of the workshops as faculty so we have here dr vijay kumar chennam chetty who is familiar to all of you in cci he's been an integral part of all these thursday meetings that we've had for a very long time now dr sonam solanki and dr shivani swami all important parts of cci we're waiting for dr prashant chajar and dr amita nini to join in and i'm hoping that they're going to join us in the next 5 minutes so amita and prashant will share nuggets about their understanding about how to host meetings conferences workshops and you couldn't have people better than them because they have done meetings which have been highly successful throughout the country and they have also collaborated internationally in the country in organizing meetings so that's what the agenda is we won't have a presentation today the plan is to keep the discussion as free flowing as possible to exchange questions and there'll be a time when i will not be a moderator and maybe shivani sonam and vijay will take over as moderator in a little while we'll exchange questions i really want you to put your questions in sooner rather than later we'll make it a part of the discussion as we go along rather than waiting till the very end to answer your questions because like we said this is an open forum we'll try and make this an open forum and we'll exchange ideas rather than giving you exact thoughts about how to go about hosting meetings so i'll start off with a bit of an introduction i promise that i wouldn't go on for long but the points i bring up in the next 5 to 6 minutes will be topics on which we'll elaborate we'll discuss in greater detail as we go along so think of meetings conferences congresses that you have been to what are the various sessions that you would have attended and here i don't talk about the academic content of those meetings i'm more talking about the nature of the talk or the teaching session that you've attended so there could be didactic lectures and didactic lectures span from anywhere between 10 minutes to half an hour didactic lectures are difficult they're difficult because you keep hearing the same voice over a long period of time often it's monotonous repetitive and hence non verbal language eye contact body language become very very important when you do didactic lecture we'll come back to that a bit we'll ask our panelists about how they go about doing successful didactic lectures but let me go to the next thing which is a panel discussion a panel discussion in my book is far more engaging you've got multiple people on it there is discussion you have questions being asked by a moderator you listen to summaries from the moderator and the moderator spans questions across the panel asks people and if it's interactive it's engaging hence in my book a panel discussion is a better mode of teaching as compared to what a didactic lecture is however a panel discussion needs to be done well and again we'll come back to what entails well a good a successful plan of doing a panel discussion i think prashant is here hi prashant welcome So I'll go on while Prashant joins in and Amita joins in. The next yeah, thing. Hi, 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 Prashant. Hi, hi, Prashant. Hi, Prashant. Good Sorry to see you. Sorry for this delay. 
not at all not at all so i'm just doing a bit of an intro uh, prashant um uh, i'll will be another three or four minutes and then hopefully amita would have joined by then and we'll come to the discussion in a minute so i was just talking about the various modalities of teaching when you go to meetings conferences and congresses and i spoke about didactic lectures and panel discussion the next thing that um, fascinates me personally and i will speak about this later on again is debates i think debates are a fun way of learning i think you exchange ideas often if you have a good orator a debate becomes very engaging because there's also a fun element to it when people pull each other's legs and are passionate about the topic that they speak on one of the same time at yeah. the same time it also uh, you know gives a much more clarity and understanding the pros and cons yeah sorry to interrupt go ahead please not at all prashant not at all so as you heard prashant it talks about pros and cons and the important part in a debate i feel is about the moderator because often if you don't have a good moderator in a debate you're left confused with mixed messages if you have someone who is very good at talking pro in favor of a motion you might go home convinced with his ideas rather than the science behind it so it's important to have a good moderator when you're doing a debate and then you have conversations and interviews i'm sure prashant has done many of these where you engage in conversation with an expert the person taking the interview is often an expert often it's a national and international faculty talking to each other and this becomes conversational this bonding if you put in a case etc in into the mix it becomes even more engaging when you do conversations and interviews so didactic lectures panel discussions debates conversations or discussions are things we have talked about what we have not talked about is the topic of today's session which is how to do go about doing a workshop a workshop is the most engaging because normally a workshop would be hands on you get your hands dirty you are in a station either with a live patient or with a mannequin or with animal models but this hands on experience and prashant is the right person here because he's done wonderful workshops in mumbai over the years which have engaged people in various ways in techniques of interventional pulmonology but there are workshops of various kinds you could have a workshop on allergy for instance advanced lung function testing sleep etc etc and again we'll come to workshops and how we go about doing workshops talking about workshops brings me to the various forms in which we have innovated over the last 2 to 2 and a half years during this huge pandemic which has swept all our lives and changed them permanently to an extent in some cases and we talk about virtual meetings like the one we are doing today think 2019 think beginning of 2020 this was not really a modality we would have used on a regular basis and look at what cci has done today they've engaged more than 1000 people every thursday week in and week out in learning and teaching and i think this is something that we have learned however doing lectures even doing panels like the one we are doing today are relatively easy workshops are more difficult however we have innovated and learned internationally nationally how to do workshops even on a virtual platform and we'll talk about them as we go along workshops are not impossible especially in certain areas of expertise on a virtual platform and maybe that's a way of learning that we need to take forward as we go along so that's about the virtual the physical you all know we are used to it we've done it for years together and then there's the hybrid model where there's some people who are there physically and then you have the lots of people from far away thousands of miles away logging in like you guys have done today and sharing knowledge even on the virtual platform so that's the physical plus the virtual element which together make it a hybrid meeting how do you become a good communicator how do you become a good orator and i think that's something that you learn as you go along the more meetings you speak at the more you engage with people the more you engage socially the more you engage on academic forums the more you learn non verbal ways of communication body language eye contact looking at people and smiling at them moving around a little bit moving your arms in a manner which make people engage with you are things that you learn as you go along and i think we'll talk a little bit about communication and oratory skills as we go along 
the other thing which we are not using today strangely enough it's used in most cases is the art of powerpoint presentation how do you make a good powerpoint presentation how do you make it uncluttered how do you have strong carry home messages when you make a powerpoint presentation is something i know amita is very passionate about and i know she'll want to speak about this when she comes but that's something that we're going to talk about the other important thing which we are not very good at as a nation and we have to get better is time keeping you have lectures you have got panel discussions which go on forever you overshoot time and i think there's a fine art in making sure that you pass across the message that is required in a in the time which is given to you so someone has a talk on ielt and you given 15 minutes it's not possible to cover 15 minutes ielt in 15 minutes so what do you do you go back to the person who's given you the topic find out what the other topics are in the meeting talk to him and find out what the carry home messages are what is it that you want the audience to know in the wide umbrella of ild that we're talking about so the carry home messages the points that you need to get across are something that the speaker needs to know from before and that takes you to preparation how do you prepare for a meeting you prepare in your own mind you prepare with the organizer of the meeting and you prepare with people who are a part of the symposium in which you are speaking if it's a symposium so that there's a least amount of overlap when people speak and that's important sonam spoke about this the other day and i think it's a very important point to prepare from before know what you're setting out to do and make sure you're not over ambitious make sure you don't have 20 points to cover in 15 minutes because you're never going to achieve that and all your 20 points will end up being half baked so select five things that you want to tell your audience make sure you've studied the evidence well make sure you've got slides which have strong carry home messages that you want to pass across to your audience when you speak to them and it's only then that you will not allow your audience to sleep off eye contact is important make sure that you engage your audience in a way that they cannot nod off to sleep they cannot look at their mobile you know when i speak on physical platforms i find out how many people are actually sending off whatsapp whatsapp messages when i'm speaking and i think that's probably something that people do people nod off on the front row that's not the person being an inattentive that's your oratory skills which is a miss which is why the person can look down on their phone and do whatsapp or the skills are not up to speed because the person is nodding off and i think those are skills that you develop over years there's a lot of people on this panel who have developed those skills over the years and we'll talk about them as we go along so that's i think enough from me i think i've spoken for about 10 or 12 minutes rather than the 7 to 8 minutes so we'll start off and maybe we'll start off with shivani so shivani workshop you go to a workshop let's start off with you going to a workshop on let's say an allergy workshop you set off with the expectation that you're going to learn how to practice allergy how to do an allergy test how to go about doing immunotherapy and you set off with those expectations to a clear, to a workshop you go to the workshop and you find there are seven lectures each over 20 minutes which are the first seven sessions and there's an hour that's been allotted to looking at allergy testing and a 20 minute slot which is supposed to be hands on teaching in immun immunotherapy you think that's the right way forward so the allergy testing is just an example but any think of any other topic you think that's the right way forward that's the expectation you're going with or are your expectations different to the way i designed or formatted this workshop for you shivani sure uh, thank you dr raja for the question so i would feel that uh, when i am looking at uh, attending a workshop the first thing that i obviously look at is the objective of the workshop about uh, how they summarize about what all they'll be teaching and what is what is it that i'm going to achieve at the end of the day what is it that uh, is going to be a skill addition to be so that's the first thing uh, apart from that i think we would all be very interested in the speakers that are there and uh, i guess what we basically look for from uh, you know attending a workshop bait any topic the first thing is that it has to be very specific like you said okay if it's about allergies then 
you know what all topics they are covering then uh, you know the outcome uh, or has to be attainable so if they're doing too many topics like seven is still all right but if they're doing, doing too many topics like 10 12 lectures in a day i don't think i'm going to come back with anything in my head it's all just going to evaporate by the end of the evening i think i'm just going to be mentally exhausted and not be able to recollect or regain anything from there the other thing it uh, the topic has to be relevant there has to be a mention about the recent advances like in terms of allergies the use of biologics also have to be included other than that i think the time distribution has to be extremely important i think even if i'm doing seven lectures after which i'm doing just one hour of allergy testing and just 20 minutes on immunotherapy which practically would be the backbone of my entire allergy practice it may not be enough maybe i would want to do more hands on of the allergy testing myself i would want more hands on of the different types of allergy tests that are available like the patch test the food allergies or drug allergies and all of it and at the same time i would want more detail about the immunotherapy because there is so so i think the timing of each lecture and each hands on workshop has to be absolutely appropriate so you know the pa- actually patient uh, i mean the student walks back learning all of it sure so very valid points shivani so the first point you made was hi hi amita hi so hi. sorry it's all right I'm just too many emergencies and really sorry you're not driving are you no no i'm sitting in the car i'm being driven okay <laughs> wonderful So we've done a bit of an introduction. You've not missed much, Chamita. I have just set the uh, stage for what we're going to discuss, and we've just asked the first questions. I've asked Shivani about her expectations from a workshop, and we spoke briefly about an allergy workshop. I and Shivani made very important points: the fact that there should be a small number of endpoints to achieve, the carry home messages, your learning points, learning objectives should be limited. the fact that there should be more hands on element to it rather than lectures there correct, shouldn't correct. be too many lectures is something that she pointed out which i thought was very very relevant and the fact that you should know what you're going to learn and go back to your practice so i think that's something that she talked about so i'll come to you sonam and then we'll involve prashant and amita and vijay so sonam do you think that there should be lectures at all or if you feel that there should be some lectures in a workshop what percentage do you reckon do you think sort of 25 75% 75% lectures 25% hands on element or should it be the reverse way around should it be 50 50 what's your expectation when you go to a workshop as a learner sure thank you sir for the question so yes i would say 50% is what i would there, there has to be 50% lecture because normally when we attend workshop it is generally to add on something to our practice so obviously it's a field we've not been doing ourselves we've just read about it during our you know post graduation or heard about them year and so i would like to know the science behind it because you know for example building on what dr shivani just said allergy testing doing the test the learning curve for doing the test for a doctor is not too much we need to know the indication we need to know what is the available data about it and when i come back from the uh, you know like from the take home it's not just the theoretical take home i also need practical take homes like where do i get these kits from what are you know where are you know, are they validated uh, patch test sublingual therapy if you know where do i source this in my practice so tomorrow when i come back and i you know put a board that i'm going to start my allergy practice based on what i have learned i also need to know the practical connection so that's where i feel 50 50 theory as well as practical is a good enough com- composition at least for a, a, a skills training workshop sure so sonam point well taken 50 50 says sonam um, i would argue that probably it's a in my book i think a successful workshop is probably a 25 75 25% being lectures and 75% being hands on i think i think the good thing about hands on on a workshop is that the questions that you want to ask might actually be asked in the station where you are uh, are at sonam so you want to acquire a patch test where do you get a patch test how would you go about doing a food allergy test if you have a food allergy station and you're standing around with one person guiding you seven to eight people crowding around i think the scenario becomes far more informal 
as compared to being seated someone stood on a on a stage and people uh, sat lecture theater becomes a bit of a challenge um so that's my understanding i think people are far more informal ask far many more questions i don't know whether Pr- prashant prashant are you there yeah yeah, yeah of sorry, course sorry. i'm there of course i'm there yeah so sona has a point i'll come to you i have got a question for you but uh, sona first go on uh, i just uh, i mean very well taken that even i if i had to ask question i would ask more questions on a uh, table but this way you know you people miss out on so if uh, there are normally three stations at a workshop so if you know a discussion which is very practical and fruitful on one station people on the other station would miss it so that's why I'm, that's what i meant about these practical discussions sure. also being a part of the lecture yeah sure so fair point sunam i so sunam says very important that you want a few lectures because the entire information gets transferred to the all the audience there is so prashant ip so we spoke about allergy so so so, so before, before before we go to ip sure you know i mean on, uh, you know on, some comments you know these were made on the allergy workshop etc so i think all the points are well taken okay but now uh, you know whenever we are talking about the distribution of lectures hands on one has to take into consideration what all hands on can be offered you know how much duration of hands on can be given okay because even in a hands on workshop it becomes extremely important that you know all the delegates are engaged for most of the time otherwise what happens is you have you have stations a delegate would go there speak there for 5 minutes that station rotation is for 45 minutes baki ka 40 minute karna kya you know it should not be that way so that point has to be taken into consideration what type of uh, hands on uh, is being arranged the other thing is you know the lecture sure. prashant 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 ek cheez puch lo prashant suno na ek cheez batao to i think what you say is a point very well made but do this in the perspective of bronchoscopy hands on so i think this is for anything this no. is for anything this is for anything you know i mean for example for so, I, I, let, let me come to this raja let me finish yeah so so, so I, I, and then we can discuss so, nee, so that's this fine. is from a work so the point is for I'm anything to get but give us an example i will give you an example i will give an example but uh, we have to keep people engaged the one more point was to, spoken about is the duration of the lectures how many lectures should i have what percentage should we have i think uh, this percentage could vary very well between even 30% to 60% now because this depends on various factors it depends on who is your audience are is your audience basically are you catering directly to uh, is your audience mainly pgs and freshers who just passed out are your audience you know uh, practitioners who been there for a few years is it a mixed audience the reason i say that is why why are lectures there the lectures at a workshop are very different from the lectures in a symposium you know in terms of the content the slides may be the same the content you have to adapt it but what you speak you know what the orator tells about the slides that means for a workshop the lec- what is the intention of the le- uh, lecture lectures so let's talk about allergy workshop the idea is to give a background you know you have to build up the concept you know you can't uh, do a workshop uh, hands on with the presumption that the entire workshop or the course people are on the same platform you need to bring them onto a common platform that's what is an important objective of the lectures you bring them on a common platform and then you move uh, and then you ramp it up so that they are able to be on the same page as you move ahead secondly is the lec- the workshop lectures again depending on what you do i think it's very important to bring in cases or case scenarios not to overlap with the workshop but again to build, bring in the uh, the strength and the understanding of the workshop so what i'm trying to say is the lectures have a specific role they are just not didactics they are they they need to have an intent what intent you are organizing the lectures before the hands on uh, component coming to this you know the sure. i mean an example i'm telling you about a i mean yeah, uh, about a say an allergy workshop you know i've never done allergy workshop but you know from what little i know you know or, or a lung function workshop i think you have a device for example 
you know i recently attended uh, a a a core a, a you know a program where a, a new new technology of the lung function device was being um, being exposed or launched or whatever now what happens is now every all each of there was one device kept there each of the delegates go there that delegate is shown how you blow in how you do out and you know you are exposed to the device and then he moves on then the other other individual comes in. what do the other people do in the meantime so what i am trying to say is a workshop uh, when you do a hands on a hands on i have learned has to be engaging you should not be able to have people just move around having a cup of tea they become very big distractors for the people who want to learn sure so prashant a few points were so very well very well taken what you've said makes perfect sense so there's a couple of things that i would like to highlight so i think what prashant says means that you have to have a wavelength with matches with what the organizer expects you to do so i've gone to been to various workshops nationally internationally where the speaker has actually done a didactic lecture the way they would do a didactic lecture and what prashant said just now is important you going to a workshop the lecture is going to be very different to what you would expect when you do didactic lectures so that's an important carry home message the other important carry home message is about getting people on the same same platform that's a huge challenge and we'll come back to this prashant later on but the fact that in our country be it a workshop be it a conference be it a meeting you have people who are at various levels the levels never meet you have the best of just consultant being there with a second year postgraduate trainee listening to the same lecture so getting people on the same platform to the same level is something which is a challenge and maybe we should discuss how to actually have people who more or less belong to the same level of uh, learning understanding when we do conferences and meetings so, so by the way one, one so one, yeah I, I, on this point sorry to interrupt i think you know um, th- what you're talking about is ideal that you can have you know people with specific uh, maybe freshers seniors etc separately yeah. but that may not be possible in our country uh, uh, at all the time so what sure. i tend to do is you know what i would recommend is that at the, the speakers the faculty should have an idea of what the audience is like so once sure. uh, the workshop is being uh, you know often it may not be possible who's registered so how do you get that idea you get that at the beginning you know so that at, at the introduction the first 10 15 minutes you get a feel of the audience how many are pgs how many are practitioners and then that is where the skill of the faculty is the sure. content which you have in slides you have to adapt it to the audience sure we'll we'll come back to this prashant i promise because this is an important topic what i was going to add before i i can see shivani's hand and then i go to vijay and then uh, amita so prashant what i was trying to say is the point that you made the one which stuck the most was you go to a workshop station you're engage hands on for about 5 minutes 2 minutes 3 minutes and then you've got nothing to do so that's the whole point about doing workshops where the station actually the teacher or the couple of teachers there are actually tell you about the device at the station itself so imagine you are doing a e bus station so if on an e bus station the first 5 or 10 minutes in a half an hour station say as an example are spent talking about e bus rather than doing an e bus lecture and you have a diagram up and you look at the media stall stations etc it's probably another way i'm not suggesting it's a better way but it's another way of doing it rather than have a separate e bus lecture for instance or the same stands true for allergy or the same stands true for sleep and so on um let me come to shivani shivani you've got your hand so quick comment because we need to sort of involve uh, vijay and then amita shivani excellent points made by prashant sir there i actually wanted to ask him a question about uh, the same thing but then eventually i think he put it up about you know uh they're going several people in a workshop right from a beginner to a senior practitioner so how to bring them up to the same level but then i think you asked that you think the conversation so 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 shivani i think that's a very important point so uh, uh i i must tell you uh, what, uh understanding the audience is very important so once you've understood the audience i think uh, the important thing that is you know there will be some things uh um, you know you, i think the importance are always the audience which is fresh you know pgs early practitioners i think a little bit more focus has to be given on them 
sometimes when i see such a big disparity i sometimes you know i apologize to the senior people that i may be saying simple things but those simple things need to be said to so that you know the the junior people are, are uh, on the same page so i think it's uh, it uh, the important thing is to bring the junior people the freshers to a particular level and then take it on so yes for the senior people sometimes in such situations where you have a mixed audience then maybe a repetition uh, for them or they say oh i know this but then you know you put it up up front in the beginning thank you thanks. wonderful points uh, let me thanks thanks so let me let me come to uh, vijay now vijay uh, i'll ask you the question which kirath has asked on the question box so you go to a workshop uh, you go you have got a selection of topics to choose from you're going to napcon you're going to cci con a large meeting but there's a choice of workshops don't tell me from a personal perspective but generally what is it that youngsters like yourself find attractive what would make you choose between one workshop to the what are the different points i'm sure it's not just one thing but what are the points which would make a workshop appealing for you vijay so uh, raja bhai uh, uh, it's a wonderful uh, discussion uh, having here okay thanks uh, cca for having me here um the important thing most important thing what i look in the brochure or in the uh, release from the conference is first important what are the topics second important who are the experts who are attending the conference that is the key factor example i would like to quote without any hesitation if dr atul c mehta is there if dr rajadhar is there i would love to you know pitch in there whatever the distance it, it may be okay because the chief reason is they highlight they are very famous because they tend to bring the pra most practical points in a convincing way so that is very very important apart from the objectives of the given workshop i would look up to the um, experts stalwarts who are there who will be guiding me so that a single point if i i would again tell you a practical example somewhere around 2009 i attended uh, uh, professor arvind kumar's uh, workshop of thoracoscopy this was uh, dr arvind was um one of the first workshop he conducted in india that was in chennai so i learned a point of how to place a port learn from the stalwart and the next to me who was sitting was one of the cardiothoracic surgeon that motivated me how easy that we can do and even thoracic surgeons are in the same phase of learning thoracoscopy so that made me so confident that i can also do this and a single point of take home point has changed my life there you go yeah rajan so vijay you make a very important point i love this point so i think if i go to a workshop and i learn one thing however trivial which stays with me for my lifetime and it impacts on my practice i would bigger give a big tick and say okay i have done a workshop i've learned something which lasts me a lifetime i think that's brilliant and that should be something that um, stays with us let me uh, i think amita is now in the comfort of her home and no, no longer in the car so amita am i correct are you there yes yes i'm there i'm there yes yeah wonderful uh, familiar surroundings again i know this background very well yes. so amita i have attended a workshop that you do have done in napcon on multiple occasions which is on uh radiology on yeah. um, imaging in um, thoracic medicine in chest medicine and i have always been impressed with the balance that you've got between lectures hands on case discussions which prashant spoke about so tell us how you plan not just this particular workshop maybe you can use that as an example i know you ring all your speakers you ring all your workshop faculty tell them what you expect them to do which i think is brilliant and i want you to tell the audience today how you go about setting up a workshop we'll talk about lectures in a bit we'll come to the best of chest which i'm very passionate about but we'll start off with this workshop tell us how you plan a workshop and how you go about implementing and making sure that people get their money's worth yeah okay so uh 
Dear yeah, Raja, first of all, I'm very very happy that we are discussing this topic today. And though it may just sound little dull, you've made it just so interesting. And I'm so happy, you know, that we have Prashant and we've got Vijay and Sonam and Shivani, brilliant colleagues, you know, who are going to really share experiences. So the thing is that I personally feel that if we want to deliver something which is good, whatever it may be, we really need to be extremely passionate about it to the extent of being actually obsessive. That's how I am. So the thing is, when I plan anything. I basically always make a WhatsApp group from before, where every delegate is a part of it. And from before, we start asking, "What are you looking out for?" And basically, we try to find out what is the seventy percent of the group wanting. So that is what we normally try to find out. And then, from much before, we call the faculty and we tell them that this is what we are looking out for. But we want tips and tricks. Like for example, in pulmonary radiology, so we know how things are to be done. But you tell us what is over and above what is given in the textbook. So if it's a twenty-minute talk, then ten minutes will be probably what everybody really knows because you need to introduce them to the subject. But then ten minutes are tips and tricks. What will help you know it better? What will help you perform it better? If you are in trouble, then how? So basically, I personally feel that these in, in, you know initial lectures are very important to make you really get oriented. and then the uh, tables will really become very important so for table it's supposed to be either case based discussions if it's ct scans or anything and if it's ultrasound chest then we actually always you we must organize simulation mannequins actual patients normal volunteers boat models but basically really give people hands on and uh, if you have good lectures then as prashant said when hands on is going on the others are discussing theory and therefore everybody gets actually quite occupied so i think planning is very important in planning on what people want and keep on hammering your faculty also important sure. is to give people what they want and we are doing the workshop not for us we are giving yeah. to the others that is very important now half the time people make a program what according to them is what they want to tell but we need to tell what people want to really know Yeah, I'm so pleased you said that, Amita. I think um, that's true not just for workshops, but any teaching session that you go to. Often we are obsessed about what we want to tell people, rather than thinking about what people want us to talk about. And I think that's something. If you learn that trick, guys, I think you're sorted for life as far as teaching is concerned. That's a very, very important point, and I'm so pleased you made that point. You've got wonderful audience today, uh, people who have. been organized so i can see questions from rajesh in the question box let me take up a question that rajesh asked and rajesh while we cannot speak to you unfortunately on this platform if you can also type in your response to what i am going to say so rajesh asks how many in a station so you're doing a workshop how many people would you actually allow how many people are ideal so i think to an extent and i'll ask uh, maybe shivani about her thoughts it depends on what sort of workshop you've gone to so for instance if you've got for gone for a interventional a bronchoscopy or thoracoscopy workshop you would want no more than 5 or 6 people in a station and maybe no more than 30 to 40 people in total which would mean that for your hands on you have to have multiple station if you're doing animal models you have to have four or five animal models with people working on them simultaneously so that you don't have more than four or five people in one station and you're doing hands on for allergy testing however i think you can probably have more people in a station you could probably have 10 or 11 people uh, people in a station because that's more about seeing it's more about interacting but i don't think there should be any station where you have more than 10 people irrespective of what station or what topic you're doing so about 30 or 40 in total maybe a maximum of 50 but you need multiple stations you need people to be engaged like everyone has said and i think the number would depend on what exactly you're going about teaching let me know rajesh whether that's correct or not ask shivani shivani what's what do you think is an ideal number any any thoughts for a workshop uh i think the seniors would be able to tell better but like just you said that uh, you know citing an example like for example when i did my allergy workshop uh we had a group of around 20 people doing the hands on for the skin prick testing and it was a very convenient way that you know we volunteered for each other in groups of two because of course there's it's impossible to get so many volunteers for doing a skin prick test so we would do five pricks on each other you know 
and so it was a very good cohesive group but when it came to discussions about doing uh, you know immunotherapy like sub sublingual or subcutaneous immunotherapy that was a larger group wherein you know one person would go on stage do uh, you know give a practical problem that they have faced and then the entire group would discuss it so i think like you said that it totally depends upon what we are discussing so if it is a hands on like you said whether it is on a uh, simulator or it is on a, a mannequin or an animal model or you know so i think it basically depends on if it's uh, something like a bronchoscopy which needs to be demonstrated maybe five people also maybe for a prolonged period if the duration of that entire session round is much more than five people is good enough but sometimes only two or three people otherwise in a shorter period would probably get a hands on feel of sure so depending on the topic small number for things which are completely hand on hands on bottle based mannequin based human body based and then for groups which you where you can actually see and learn you can have a slightly larger number but the number needs to be minimal and i think that's what rajesh was alluding to prashant quick question for you if you are there how do you keep people to time so when i say how do you keep people to time so i you're also now back home right prashant no no i'm Security. still in the office oh you're still in the office all right okay so prashant uh, tell me in the way of being an organizer and someone who is actually faculty at a workshop how do you ensure that people stick to time how do you ensure that you stick to time when the time is a challenging factor when you've given been given less time than what you would actually want how do you ensure time keeping so so i think you know uh, your your last point first you know you said that you know you've been given less time you know so uh, i think uh, <clears throat> you know it's easy to do a talk in half an hour 45 minutes i think the skill of the faculty comes when the same information you have to communicate within the defined time okay so i think uh, you know so if you know we we've done programs where we said okay this is just going to be a 10 minute didactic strictly followed by a 5 minute discussion okay so some you know it worked for half of the faculty it didn't work for half of the faculty so you would to go 12 13 minutes then you have got to be slept so i made a small tweak there as okay <clears throat> we have a 45 minute session 10 10 minutes each stop at 10 minutes so you don't have time to overshoot and the 15 minutes are, are at the end for a discussion so all the faculty's uh, question answer sessions are taken in that so this is one way second way is to just communicate and uh, you know in advance and say that you know we would be sticking to time and one way of doing that is starting a program on time so sure. it's 9 o'clock it's 9 o'clock yeah and then everybody boss there is going to be lunch at 12 there's going to be lunch at 12 full stop so everything whatever happens you know so if you are doing a program you know on a regular basis so you do this once or twice and people know of course this is how it works so i think uh, everybody needs to establish that reputation and the third thing is you know these bells and all i think then uh, the moderator or the chair has to bell the cat and say all right yeah. boss 10 minutes are done we are very sorry at the most you have one minute and then uh, we stop so i think this is the way sure. and as far as you know a, a, a challenge i mean you know i think for those who have come to the ipl i mean you know uh, i mean it's fun if you have a lot of time is lost in tea breaks and lunch breaks so i mean i take the initiative of taking the bell and i say i make sure that everybody has to get into this uh, into the uh, auditorium because i mean you know if if somebody wants to cheat and chat then they are outside the zone you know you don't be in that zone where you are attracting people so you know you had time 20 minutes to finish your cup of tea you can't say i need 5 minutes more so somebody has to go in a polite way and say boss this is my bell you know you must have seen the way i ring my uh, yeah. bell and like bell so the cat is you there yeah. yeah so these are the some of the things i hope i've answered your question is there anything more specific you have indeed no, absolutely you have absolutely you have so i'll come to you amita in a moment um 
So Rajesh says 50 people, maximum of 10 people per station, which is, I think, more or less what we said. So that's grand. Quick comment from you, Vijay. I have a question for Sonam, and then I'll come to Amita. So Vijay first. This, this is what I, I learned, uh, Rajabai, from our earlier meeting, where make this coffee breaks into... Uh, let the coffee break co coffee being served at the conference itself on the on the table that's what i learned recently from you so so that we can um, convert this tea break or coffee uh, break into buffer time so that we can extend one important thing and second important i completely agree with uh, prashant by saying that stick to the time but one of my friend good friend a cardiology colleague what he does is he gives a hint he doesn't uh, ring the bell, but he gives a hint. The moment, as an organizer, he stands and then holds his uh, hands like this. That means he tells to the speaker well in advance, if I'm standing and holding my hands, means it's your time is already done. So he has to complete the talk. That's what from me. Thank you. Yeah, so absolutely, Vijay. So I think polite way of... Uh, yeah. So I don't think you. So I don't think you can always be polite, uh, Vijay. So I have grown, grown. I think beyond being polite, I think you have to go and stand in front of the stage yeah. and says your time is up. Yeah, I think you. I mean, I think in lectures switching the screen off is a great way of getting people to stop. But I think what Prashant said, what you said, the carry home message is you have to be brutal. You have to get people to stop on time. Let me come to Son you, Sonam, and then I'll come to you, Amita, and. Uh, uh, hold your comment uh, in your mind. I will come to you for your comment. So Sonam, uh, we'll move beyond workshops now and we'll go to other modalities of teaching. And I want to start off with lectures. So, you know, lectures are probably the most difficult because they can be the most boring. You have to hear the same monotonous voice over and over again, droning on for long periods about which you might know a lot or you might not be interested in. So you've gone from being a listener to a speaker and you now regularly speak at various meetings. Tell the audience today, how have you picked up little things from being a delegate and listening, not just about the academic bit, but also about the various facets of being a good orator? And how have you transferred that knowledge into being a good speaker, which I know you are? So, uh, <clears throat> so when I was a student, okay, so uh, I, I'd like to see, you know, see it's a journey. When you are a PG student, when you pass out freshly during your PG, any basic knowledge is also knowledge because, you know, you're anyway going to read that in your books. But, it, you know, when you listen to that in a lecture, it's great. Uh, secondly, when you are speaking, the first thing I have realized is that when the speaker is speaking on something which is very irrelevant to the theme of the whole event, whatever the theme of the event is, you have to make your presentation relevant to that. It's not about displaying how much you know, it's just about making whatever you're speaking just relevant to the theme that what a listener is going to listen to from morning to evening, where you fit in and give, give that one take home message and one, uh, you know, uh, important practical point. Second, I start by and this is of course, I'm not saying that this is all me, I've literally listened to people observed all you guys when you know, I was a PG student, I've attended every IPL, etc. Uh, I've noticed that sticking to time, there, there is something that Hinduja group does where they give the uh, speaker a warning. It's not that cut off, you know, you don't have to be that brutal to the speaker because of course you don't want to disrespect them. You give a warning sign. 10 minutes before the presentation, your their time is up, you can give a warning. And this is what I start my presentations and talk with that I tell the moderators that please give me a warning when there is only 10 minutes left. So then I can, you know, wrap up because the important take home messages are at the end. You don't want a speaker to get flustered by just telling them, okay, now stop speaking. So instead of warning at the end of uh, the 20 minutes, you give a warning at 15 minutes. That is one practical thing. When I'm planning for my talk, uh, I speak to the person who has invited me about who the audience is going to be, what what you think I should have. So recently, where it was for PG students, so we kept it simple for you know uh, slides which are just too much information which no matter if i'm going to speak at for even 15 minutes i describe you know uh, the interpretation it's not so i give time to the audience that please take a photograph of this because this is something like a resource for you 
that is one thing that i do and uh, if i have 20 minutes i first decide how many slides i want to have and how many minutes per slide i can give so that at least time is so in my head i reverse uh, you know engineer the talk and these are just small practical tips that i follow and yeah. i mean i cannot uh, i mean thank you for the compliment of being a good i don't know about the content but at least i'm on time this is the first thing i start with is i want to be on time that's it yeah Grand, very very important points, and I think it shows that you have started speaking not so long ago, because these are sort of tips that you start doing it, and then at one point of time you become like an Amita or a Prashant, but this comes to you subconsciously over a period of time. So, uh, thank you. I think great tips for people who are young, who started speaking, who want to start speaking at public podiums, platforms, etc. Let me come to you, Amita. Yeah, so two parts. The first part was you know how to make sure the speaker is on time. So basically, what is really mandatory is. Can I ask you? Can I can I ask you my question, Amita? And you can sort of uh, add in what you're saying. So I was going to ask you about best of chest. Okay. Yeah, gonna... Okay. Sorry, one minute before you ask the question, I just want to add one important point which nobody's spoken about. Yeah. About making the speakers yeah. to time. So that was like we have to make sure there's a huge timer on the stage, and we have to make sure there's a timer on the screen. of the speaker and on the screen of the audience and basically the thing is that the moderator or the chairperson even before the lecture start has to say that we are going to be tough on time at the end of 15 minutes the talk finishes you have three timers please keep on looking you know so i basically feel that that is mandatory because otherwise it just goes on one minute one minute one minute that was one thing and uh, okay you ask me your question i i want to make some other point but it's okay yeah. No, so what I was going to ask, make the point, but I sir, maybe you can amalgamate the question that I'm going to ask, the answer with whatever you have to say, Amita. So I was going to tell you about, as an example, Best of Chest is one of the best meetings that I have done or listened to. Thank the, you. The speciality about the meeting is that the entire meeting, even at three and a half, four hours, is extremely engaging. So tell our audience about the preparation, both from an organizational point of view, from your side, and then as a speaker. that you need to make about topics which are actually quite innovative where you have to read up you don't have prepared slides because you're talking about recent advancements so how do you go about as an organizer and then as a faculty in going about preparing talks which are engaging okay so as an organizer i basically give lot of respect to my every speaker so basically the thing is right from the process of inviting i make them feel that only he or she can do this and i'm so overwhelmed to have them on team i basically there's nothing greater than respect and we need to give it even if it's our best test friend giving respect is very important because immediately there is connection and they want to give their best to you because you are actually acknowledging their talent and their contribution in making your program successful so i genuinely feel that everybody has to really respect their colleagues who they are inviting that's number one the second thing is that we have to plan everything right from a to z and nothing should be taken for granted so basically we actually search what are the topics which are hot what would be the different crowd because you'll have students from consultants to hods and what is something that will help everybody and what is most important is that you know you want people to go home learning at least three or four points which is going to change their practice so three to four points is different for a student different for a consultant and different for a really seasoned practice practitioner so you have to tell the speaker i want this according to me if people even learn three or four new points your job is done so that is the, from the planning point of view and also what i do is that i keep coffee breaks or tea breaks only to compensate on time so though the book says there is coffee break from 11 to 11:15 that break never happens but you know if at all anybody is running late we use up that time and coffee is served on table so that was about planning the program i want to say something about being a speaker i basically just want to know that we have to really work hard on our powerpoint presentation and our topic because our presentation is our introduction to the world and we can never stop being passionate about our talk that everybody thinks i am a good talker so now i can just say anything so please work hard on every presentation then the second very important point is that the focus is the audience and not the lecturer very often we may want to say that i do this in my experience and this and that please we need to understand that we are not here to blow our own trumpet please talk about what is pertaining to the talk 
and if our work is you know add some special stuff then it's great but please don't move the focus from the audience to ourselves that's very very important and important provide clinically relevant information which is up to date and evidence based not our experience based motivate the audience to learn more you talk in such a way that they want to learn more and you want to contribute to learning and you want to contribute to good ideal practices so that is something i feel and last thing is that always think ahead you know like you kind of want a good presentation start really well start with a case presentation this patient had this now 1 2 3 4 5 instead of starting with the talk and so the beginning should be really good and please think give time and you know 10 minutes of thinking for 10 days is better than 3 hours of thinking on the last day so basically if you want the lecture to be gripping innovative interesting think how you will keep attention of the audience instead of just last minute do it in etc wonderful points thank you very much amita so i think uh, i won't try and summarize it because there's so much of information and um, amita is always but was very lucid uh, i'll come back to you in a bit amita about powerpoint presentations and how they should be made i know you're very passionate about this so i'll come back to you in a moment i'll ask vijay and then i'll go to prashant so vijay you've started speaking at meetings and i've heard you speak in the last two weeks on a couple of occasions and you do it very well what do you think when you speak so oratory skills is what we are talking about uh, communication skill is what we are talking about what as a young speaker someone who started speaking at platforms in the last 2 3 years what are the important points in your mind as a communications as a communication skill that you use when you speak uh thank you raja bhai for this wonderful question first of all um on this uh, uh, occasion i would like to um, uh, bring to notice of uh, all the listeners so i was not a good speaker in probably you know few uh, years back but what made me is consistent practice example i run a dnb program for the past uh, close to 7 8 years so i make my students and listen to them first okay on the given topic and two three days later i take those points and what is the evidence i collect and then i combine the powerpoint and then i present to them in a modified version and then that brings lot of confidence first first talk would go for probably around uh, one hour if uh, but we are destined to complete in 20 minutes so the first time always give a lecture to your students and uh, uh, give a lecture right in front of uh, mirror so that gives you lot of confidence and preparation and record it sometimes but well, that is very very important sometimes you have to record your statements and then listen to it so that gives lot of lot of confidence and where to cut down where to um, censor it where to add it where to modify it these kind of things and on this platform i would really love to uh, profusely thank dr amita for uh, bringing out a master of ceremony in me through best of chest dr amita phenomenal i never realized i can do such a wonderful performance through best of chest and after that i have done so many mcs i receive lot of uh, um, appreciations from many of our colleagues thank you amita so but thank you you have been our best uh, mc till date of this test <laughs> raja so bhai think, over to you yeah so thanks thanks vijay so i think uh, vijay makes very important points and i think there are very very few people who are born speakers i think it is a quality that you inculcate over a period of time so just i'll take one minute and then go to prashant i actually learned speaking by standing in front of the mirror and speaking i couldn't speak to save my life at one point of time when i had passed my uh, mbbs so i learned that standing in front of the mirror timing myself going through points which sonam and shivani and vijay made a little while ago and ticking boxes that i went along and i think it's an acquired skill and all of us can learn to be very good speakers over a period of time if you have the zeal to learn everyone can be a wonderful communicator and a speaker quick point vijay then i have to go to prashant yeah. yes uh, recently recently i learned uh, one very very important point before talking onto the mic you take a deep breath 
and then start miracles happen thank you thanks vijay that's great i'll try that next time i haven't tried that i have to say prashant i'll come to you so as one of the senior most faculty having spoken at hundreds maybe thousands of meeting your take on being a good communicator oration skills and i want you also to speak about non verbal communication eye contact body language etc and how you go about doing these things on a lecture how do you engage people so uh, raja i think very important points you know the last thing first about the eye contact i think uh, the eye contact is uh, very important when we look at the audience because it has many benefits one is uh, it helps to have less delicate sleeping number 2 is i think the eye contact gives a feel whether the delegates are following what you say so in the eye contact if i get a feeling that maybe you know uh, what i'm saying is probably not being absorbed because maybe i reach late at the conference venue i just reached before just my lecture did not get the feel of the audience i think looking into the eyes allows us to get a feel of how the audience is uh, perceiving the talk and accordingly you have to adjust you know that's very important you know i mean uh, some there are uh, you need to make some emphasis points maybe you need to ask a question if you and give yourself a few seconds to adapt so i think looking into the eyes helps to adapt the talk very well and then and it's a continuous process you keep looking and the more you see them they are getting engaged that you know you yourself are on the right track not from the content point of view but you are probably then communicating what the audience wants to understand and wants to learn so i think this uh, is uh, very important uh, from a eye contact point of view second impo- you know another important thing uh, in is you know i think uh, the podium is such a huge honor in life i think you know we need to uh, understand that and a very important thing you know which i try always to remember myself as has been you know actually told by my mentor is on the podium you know we should not try to mislead anyone that's extremely important not that people do it consciously and how would you do that the slides what we have what we use need to have a reference and it becomes evidence based because what happens eventually is you know what i mean the risk is if we are not having if we are not used to using references for our slides then that me automatically comes out you know the the me and then you you know then my experience and my practice all is good i'm not saying that's wrong because sometimes in a clinical scenario you need to say okay this is what the evidence is this is what my practice is but you know that cannot be the major chunk uh, of the discussion sure. so i would say references are extremely uh, important sure another important thing is you know it's very easily said that the slides should be very simple and easy to read and all all that is done you know you should have not more than six or seven you know uh, uh, rows all is good but i think whenever we speak we should i i try to make a point that i don't move outside the context of the slide that is extremely important you have to use the co- you may not want to read the slide but you should, one has to stay in the context of the slide sure and lastly you know i mean there are many points but two important points of say you know one important thing is about tables and about complex diagrams i mean you know you just imagine that you know you're sitting in the audience and somebody is really reading out the whole table to you and all just imagine that imagine in front of you there is a big complex 
you know a diagram of basic science of you know asthma and uh, you know all the different uh, chemokines and all the allergens and all the uh, you know and all the uh, whatever things that happen in the body upon exposure yes all that is important but i think for the table and for the diagram i think it's extremely important that the orator would simplify that for the audience you know it's not only talking high fund do things it's about simplifying it and communicating it and i think that's what allows you know sometimes you may be asked to do a complex talk which involves mechanisms which involves data which is, then i think uh, simplifying it and then sometimes adding a practical perspective to it allows you to engage the audience better sure can i just so, add something please raja Yeah, uh, yeah. Go on, Amita. Then yeah. I'll go back yeah. to you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Prashant, you know, 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 you know the trick is look beyond the last row of people so if there's a last row you look beyond that everybody will feel you're looking at them but actually you're not looking at anybody and therefore you're not getting nervous so people who start that do that that's one thing second thing is please dress up well when you come for a talk you know you better be looking serious about your talk if you want to be taken seriously so very often people feel are i am so used to talking i can just go so please be formally dressed that's number one the second thing is that when you talk please be very very humble don't say i do this please say we do this you know don't yeah. say my work it's our work so please be humble you'll be immediately liked by people and they will connect with you and the third thing is that sometimes you know the podium is very tall and some of us are short and therefore we just can't be seen so however good our talk is if you are not going to be seen nobody wants to listen to us so if you know your talk from before please move away from the podium and make sure you are being seen and keep on gesticulating keep your hands moving keep your body moving and just make it look like you are so much a part of this talk and everybody will want to really connect with you and our raja does that you know he really gesticulates beautifully he is so enthusiastic to talk and then you really want to listen to him so i just think really that these things would kind of you know make the audience be connected with yeah. you it to become boring I think, i think both of you do that very well and i think it's very important one point i'm going to say is i always look up to you know the good speakers you know you have to learn from them you know what are the commonalities so i think that's very very important yeah so i was going to say so amita read my mind i was going to ask you prashant uh, you did something even subconsciously while you were speaking i think the body language the way you gesticulated used your hands when you were speaking the pauses that you had all of those i think are important things to learn even on a virtual platform i think those are very very important non verbal communication modalities emphasizing changing your voice tone the tonality changing uh, amita spoke very nicely about gesticulating and using your hands properly walking around on the stage if you can do that confidently making sure that the microphone is exactly at the same place even if your head is turning around is something which is very very important so sonam you've got your hand up so quick question then i'll go to shivani your point as sonam you sonam mean? you're on mute sorry so thank you sir so you all shared about what worked for everyone i just wanted to put in one thing there is evidence that watching yourself recorded you know you speaking and recording that and taking feedback so one of the things that absolutely changed the way i speak is that one of our paraclinical staff was attending something you know she's like let me listen to you speak on ild and i i asked her just you know what was your feedback and from from she's like you were so fast that it looked like you didn't know and you want to rush through so and that is something i never thought of so literally asking for feedback from people you know who are going to be brutally honest with you and again you have to it's an art and i wanted to ask you that that how do you not take it personally uh, when you know you look at the audience and someone is uh, you know looking in their mobile and it's always going to happen there are going to be 20% of the people who probably have adhd 
I am one of those that I I get distracted very easily. So you have to learn to not take it personally and get those feedbacks, and that completely could change because the feedback is so personal to how you are being seen by people. Sure. So short question. Yeah, go on. Short, yeah, short, go on. short. <clears throat> I think uh, you know I uh, actually um, can relate to what Raja said about you know in front of the mirror and uh, what Vijay and Sonu have said. You know, uh, when we started speaking, we used to have to make those thirty-five millimeter slides. <laughs> Once you made the slide, it was done, boss. You cannot change. You know, ten minutes before it. Okay, so that was one thing. So you really had to be sure about the slide in advance. That was an advantage of those slides. The point I'm saying is <clears throat> that I actually bought a projector at home. I still have it. So all the slides that were made initially. i would use it to uh, rehearse so you know projecting on the wall getting family members to listen to you then family members bore away that i would call my friends to listen to me you know i used to cook for them bola khane ke pehle you have to uh, listen to me so i think this is extremely important that uh, you know if somebody starting on this journey the reason i'm put saying this is that when you do a medical talk and you have a non medical audience i think you know the trick is at a point when even the non medical people start to get some gist or get the story out of it and i think that's the time when you wait it sure sure very important point prashant and often there is a non medical audience there and to engage them probably is the most challenging so completely agreed and sonam very interesting that you talked about talking fast that was one of the i have got i have been lucky enough to have critics who have been brutally honest with me so i'll say it on this platform today sandeep would always call me and tell me that i spoke too fast he would tell me that i spoke about things i wanted to speak about rather than telling people what they wanted to hear so he has been a great critic who's actually made me a much better speaker the other thing which brings me to my question um, which i'm going to ask shivani in a moment is i think the virtual world has also taught me how to speak you know this is like speaking in front of a mirror you know when i speak on a virtual platform i can actually see myself gesticulating i can actually see my lips moving i know how fast or how slow i am going and i've also got a watch at the bottom of my laptop to tell me whether i'm exceeding time or not so that's been a teaching lesson so shivani the question i wanted to ask you and we'll dwell on this for 3 or 4 minutes quick comments after your comment about speaking on the virtual platform what do you find different as a listener a delegate on a virtual platform and how do you find it different when you're speaking on the virtual platform and how have you adapted to the covid times and the new covid norms and i'll come to you amita after that first thing i would say is that i have been very technologically challenged so for me to adapt to the virtual platform wasn't really easy it's still not maybe uh so there were times you know i think virtual platform has its own struggles of the ppt not working or audience not able to see your slides or you know those things the other thing i think uh, per se also when i talk i am a very fast speaker so maybe i used to forget this when i'm doing a talk from a podium but when i do it virtually i realize it myself and i correct myself because i have this habit that even in a conversation i speak really really fast so i think that is one thing that i have corrected i may not be able to do it when i'm speaking from a podium uh so those are things that have certainly changed also the content you know there are times when you pre record your talks and then you go back and hear it and you feel okay this needs to be changed so on the virtual platform occasionally you do have that chance of you know going back and changing it which is not possible when you're doing it physically sure but physically i had a very bad experience that there was this particular conference that i went to and i was uh, given a time of 15 minutes So I prepared my talk for thirteen minutes, gave it a two-minute buffer that I thought I'm going to be able to finish it. I'm bang on time. I actually did the talk multiple times and checked. Okay, it's perfectly on time. I'm very well prepared. When I went there, I realized that the during my talk, I realized that they had actually made the slot for twelve minutes and kept three minutes for you know the question and answer. And my talk was already thirteen minutes. So that's something that I was able to improvise on. which yeah. was thanks to the virtual platform because you know we do this and then we are able to improvise immediately sure. in time yeah. so those are things that the virtual platform has actually i think 
brought the better out of most of us i would feel yeah 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 so i think that's it and i have also learned to you know keep uh, when even when i'm presenting i i'm able to imagine myself as the audience as to what is it that they would want to learn what is it sure. that they would want to take home and very often i may be very passionate about the subject that i'm talking about but may not have in depth knowledge of it so once i'm given the topic i actually end up reading a lot about it yeah and then filter out what is relevant to the audience and then present it accordingly yeah yeah grand very important points shivani i'll quickly go to amita amita uh, we are in the last 10 minutes we'll need to take some audience questions so your thoughts your teaching points <laughs> to the audience about a virtual platform and maybe a mention of the hybrid platform and whether you find the hybrid platform the most challenging i do that's why i'm asking yeah so basically the thing is you know uh, i feel that the advantage of having a physical talk is you are actually looking at your audience and from the expressions from the body language you know if to continue on the same ground or kind of completely change your uh, your road you know so basically that is the advantage where is you know on a virtual platform i mean basically on a hybrid meeting or something we can never look at our audience so the thing is that we may have lot of number of participants but we really don't know if they are listening to us so sure. i kind of uh, put in even more efforts when it's online meeting because i want to make sure that people are really listening to me and they are engaged so that was one thing and the second yeah. thing is that uh, i just kind of feel that we should always be very excited about what we do because if we are not excited nobody else will and so despite giving lectures for many years even today if i have to give a talk i will actually practice and i'll time myself and i do it without fail so the thing is that i keep on doing it again and again and again till i finish it at least 3 to 4 minutes before time that was one and the second thing is that i also talk really fast and i somehow can't help it so i make it a point to repeat a few things again and again and again so if you are talking yeah. fast if you are nervous keep on repeating the points and the point will be driven home and i kind yeah. of feel that it's always good to have audience participation so if at all like sonam said if you think audience is not really listening and you want them to listen so best is you know that you know i've given a lot of information and i've got great audience over here was so bright so one small question let's see who gets it right and you ask them really a simple question which everybody can answer but because they've answered the question they are suddenly very happy and they are with you so i think best is to ask a question a simple question which they can answer and the audience is suddenly with you yeah very important points absolutely brilliant i find the hybrid platform difficult uh, amita because along with looking at the audience you also have to look at a camera which i find very difficult you know you sort of shift between the camera and looking at the audience you cannot keep looking at both which i find difficult and your hand gestures etc have also got to be directed in two different directions but i guess we are all learning there's something i'll i'll come to you vijay i can see your hand but um, you know uh, 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 dr krishna bhai has put something in the question box and i think it's an important point so people like krishna bhai agam very importantly actually put in a lot of fun they put in jokes they actually have a lot of interaction with the audience by sharing things which are personal but are great fun and i have seen agam always introducing meetings talking about what is important for a particular day so for instance today is the 23rd of uh, june i'm sure if agam was on this platform for moderating would have said what are the things that had happened on 23rd june across the century so these are fun things i've seen krishna bhai cracking jokes um and starting off meetings which i feel feel is great so vijay the fun part which i have to put my hands up i've never managed to do it for my meetings but maybe i'll i, I will try to do it in the future so is that important how do you engage when someone does that you find it more endearing when you listen to people like that speaking and please make the point for which you raised your hand yeah obviously uh, raja bhai when we start listening to the lectures first 5 minutes to 8 minutes will be very very quite attentive but if we want to listen uh, make our uh, uh, delegates to listen for probably beyond that 8 minutes time we need to have a lot of lot of you know uh, fun mix interactions maybe put a joke put a cartoon uh, kind of thing and uh, as dr nene was telling so she asks a question 
and then probably more interactive session if at all the um, uh, automatic pads will be there where we can respond to the questions these things would make definitely more uh, attractive more uh, involvement we can draw more involvement from the delegates and the point i would like uh, love to make here is we have to be uh, to make ourselves more confident than delegates so we must invest in lot of literature reading once we read enough literature and makes that yes no one would have uh, read this much literature at least maximum 95% of delegates should not uh, have read that much then automatically our confidence of presentation will go high and um, thanks to uh, i was just recollecting good memories from dr radha munje ma'am i used to share my presentation with dr radha ma'am she used to brutally honest and was very very polite enough here you have to correct these are the mistakes so you have to have such wonderful friends in your circle so that to we can improvise our uh, speaking skills and stick on to the time as well yeah so it's great to spoke about one quick thing yeah sure yeah i just want to say that you know first 3 to 5 minutes of the talk are important nobody can concentrate for more than that so please have your beginning the beginning has to be the ace card first 3 to 5 minutes you just get the audience like addicted to your talk and your talk is really going to be easy so that is something which is very very important and the second thing is it's good to be humorous it's good to crack jokes but you should also have content because if you only keep on cracking jokes then people actually start looking around so it's great to be humorous but please make sure to match your humor you have great content also sure um and that's what instagram is all about isn't it you are first 15 seconds is all that the video is about and it catches your audience and i think that's something that we can also learn as we go along i completely agree with you amrita i think the first minute 2 minutes if you can catch on to your audience then they're going to listen to you for 10 minutes for sure i think that's that's a very important message i was just going to say vijay i'm, I'm so pleased you spoke about dr radha munje dr radha munje is listening to us today and one of the questions she's asked takes us back to the workshop but i think it's still worth revisiting again she asks how many people per station is important how many people at maximum can you have to engage on hands on skills and i think we answered that question we said five or six when it's hands on but i wanted to ask a different question quickly to prashant if prashant you're there do you think with hands on stuff so especially with bronchoscopy ebers thoracoscopy etc the workshop should be followed up with centers of excellence where you can go and learn the art in the long term because in my mind workshops are actually just to stimulate interest in a particular area it tells people i'm interested in this i want to take ownership but the learning has to be over a more long term period so is that something you think we should engage in as societies going forward <clears throat> absolutely i think <clears throat> that's a very important point you know what is the reason why an uh, individual is attending a workshop now depending on what workshop it is you know the uh, different objectives can be attained in an international workshop what would be the goals one goal would be it's an introduction for that individual to a particular technique so it is an introduction to the individual to understand a particular technique and also for the individual to get a feeling that yes i can imagine myself doing this so i think these are the important objectives in a workshop and therefore you know uh, in an interventional workshop uh, one must not go with the aim that i would go there i would see something i would get a feel of some of the equipment and then i would go and start doing it immediately this is what i'm saying for the individuals who are post graduates who are uh, early into the practice and it also really depends on how much exposure you've had during the training so i think these are the objectives for some senior people the objectives are different or somebody who are in middle practice they've actually come there 
to take an opportunity to solve some of their clinical uh, questions. This is what we see in practice or some skill related issues, how we tackle a particular thing. So the station is also looked as an opportunity to interact with the, uh, you know, uh, with the senior. So if somebody has been just introduced to a technique there, then I think it's extremely important that uh, the individual understands that it is not a license to go and start an uh, advanced technique immediately, unless you are already in an environment where you've got mentors to guide. <clears throat> if you're on your own, I think it's important, like Raja said, that one has to use this as an opportunity to introduce yourself and then try and find yourself into, I know that there are limited fellowship programs. And this year, I must say, uh, you know, uh, fortunately, uh, bro, uh, uh, the IAB had two program, two centers which run an interventional uh, fellowship course. They, they are in Delhi with, uh, with Rajiv Goel and with Talwa. Now we've got, two, we've actually, uh, accredited two more centers, one with uh, Nagarjuna, one with uh, Patabi, and we hope we are able to do more. So idea would be to get into one of the centers, but these centers are small. So how do you do that? Then I would say an important thing is some of the clinicians may not have a formal program. One has to understand that going and working with someone and getting the skills, it's just not a question of a few weeks. Sure. Please understand this very clearly. It's not only about doing the procedure. It's over a period of time, understanding what would I do if things went wrong? That's what you need to understand. The sure. other important thing which needs to be understood in these centers is that how do I choose the patient? <clears throat> is this procedure indicated for this patient? Is this the most appropriate procedure for the patient? Just because I can do a bronchoscopy, should I do this? Or would it be really simpler and you yeah. can get more tissue if somebody went by a CT guided biopsy? So I think the things to be learned in addition to the skill are identifying the current patient, correct patient, identifying the correct procedure, and also knowing what things can go wrong and how you can solve the things. You know, it's not about, I know, you know, I looked at it, I, I've seen the videos, I can put a stent. Fantastic, you put a stent. Boss, what if the stent moves? What if the stent doesn't yeah. deploy properly? Wonderful point. Sure. What yeah. about, you know, somebody comes back, you know, after, uh, you know, uh, two months and he's got re -stenosis. How are you going to tackle that? So for this purpose, Raja, as you said, the workshop in an intervention is an introduction. And it has yeah. to be followed up with, uh, if possible, formal training, or you spend good time with experienced people. Yeah. And please, you know, please, you know, I, but last thing, I get very yeah. disappointed when somebody says, boss, I just passed my MD six months ago. Sir, you have to work with one month. What will you do in one month? It won't be an introduction. Yeah. So I think very, very valid points. And so pleased you said all that. It saved me the time to actually ask these questions. So I think what Prashant says, important for all of us to learn is what to do, but more importantly, what not to do. I think that's a very, very important thing to learn and think about. So I can see our young colleagues have all got, all got their hands up. So we'll start with Shivani. We'll go to Sonam and then Vijay and we'll finish off with Amita. We are run out of time. So Shivani, you go first. So excellent points made by Prashant sir yet again. I, uh, I, I mean, this is how we started. So whenever we do a procedure for the first time, we always ask a senior to be on backup. We always, you know, discuss with the senior, okay, okay is this the right thing to do? Is this the right to, way to go? And then always have somebody senior who's been doing that particular procedure as a backup within the institute at that time. So that if, you know, at any point we're going wrong or we're getting stuck, we have somebody we can depend on. And I have found it really useful. So uh, what would you say? Yeah. yeah. Can I just say something? We have to be very careful here. You know, to have somebody as a backup, please, this is not a universal rule. It really depends at what level you're doing a bronchoscopy. You may have done something basic, you're aware of it, and then maybe you're just doing a one step further procedure. And for that, you need or something you've done a few times, you're doing one, but you need somebody for a backup. <clears throat> so I think an important constituent 
in an endoscopy suite should be a sofa set, which I have in mind. You know, you want people like me to come and sit there. You are doing the procedure. Boss, कुछ हो गया तो I can immediately get up and uh, help you around. So I think it really depends at what level the individual who is doing the procedure is at. If and that the the level may demand that somebody needs to be present there all the time. A level may demand that somebody is around in the campus. Sure. Sure, Shivani. Quick point: we have we have run out of time, so quickly we probably need to do a chapter two. I was wondering whether we can finish in um, a day or not, uh, but we have run out of time. So, Shivani, your comment, Sonam, and then let's go to uh, Vijay and then Amita. Sonam. Right. So, just building from what uh, Dr. Charger said, that you know, this actually gives me an idea that if you know you do, we conduct these workshops which are hands-on. I think it will be good that the delegates, even after the workshop, have some sort of communication and access to those centers. Of course, we have very few centers of excellence. It can, I mean, they cannot digitally give you a video call that okay, this is the complication of a procedure. But right from you know when they are thinking, they pose this patient. So some sort of back and forth, if with the mentors is possible, I think that will be very helpful. full and especially for young to medium people in practice so that they they don't just start doing what they you know just because they don't have any everybody has to build their practice so communication and access to seniors is uh, appreciated so on that point is very well taken one has to be extremely careful here that you know i think uh, yes it's desirable that you can be in contact with somebody who organize the workshop but ideally you should be in contact with your own mentor I think that's extremely important. I think you know you it can't be that fifty people at the workshop. Mentorship of excellence very important. Yeah. Yeah. So it can't be that you know uh, some fifty people are in a workshop and then you know that individual who conducts the workshop becomes accessible to fifty people. You know that that that's not practically uh, feasible. I think it's it's so important. Of course, one has to be fortunate to have a mentor, but I think it's so important to seek for one. We've got so many years of practice ahead of us, you know. So I would really urge, you know, that please spend some few years uh, in working with somebody who's experienced, with a mentor, and you know, don't worry about the money loss that you'd have for the first few years. You know, I can confidently tell you, pulmonary medicine is. going to be the highest revenue branch after 2025 so don't worry about the money yeah prashant so most important branch but we cannot let our meeting run over because then we fall apart on the principles of doing a good meeting so we need to finish now so let me come to vijay and then amrita and then we'll finish vijay brilliant point uh, points made by dr sonam dr prashant and dr shivani so i have all i am agreeing completely with them so my only point is i want to share one uh, real time experience shared by one of my friend i i will not name my friend's name here the reason being the first moment he, he attended a workshop thoracoscopy workshop and then went on started practicing on a patient uh, without any proper backup it bled profusely thanks to uh, his talent and skills he could control it and then he could come out of it this happened rajabai uh, trust me 10 years back and he is yet to do his second procedure yeah so let's be careful and point number 2 um, i want to ask you and then uh, dr amita and dr prashant how to uh, plan financial planning which is very very important in uh, in designing the workshops and then how to charge how much to charge to our delegates and there you go yeah so vijay i am sorry i don't think we'll have time to answer that question but i think in principle the mm -hmm. cost should be low but there should be a charge for sure it should be something which is affordable to a postgraduate trainee and we shouldn't have to depend on a pharmaceutical company to pay that amount and i think that's very very important the involvement is important but the amount shouldn't be large let me come to you amita so concluding comments from you and then i'll finish off uh, uh your comments carry you home message for the audience about arranging meetings and workshops okay so in fact uh, i'm going to say something different because everybody is given fantastic information i'm going to touch upon something which is not touched basically we should also know how to make a powerpoint presentation correctly because that is our face to our audience so basically uh, i'm just going to give two three very simple points where we tend to make mistakes so basically you should know if your lecture hall is going to be dark 
then you must have a dark background ideally for a dark background a navy blue with white and blue white and yellow font is the best okay but if it's going to be a lit up place then the background should be light best would be a white background that's very very important so that was the first thing then the second thing would be that if you want to project x rays or ct scans then the background has to be dark so if you have a white color slide and you want to put a x ray then please put a black color border around it otherwise nothing will be really seen then the third point which is also very important is please do not have graded colors you know people start with light brown and light brown 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 then the fonts really mix with it so have like a solid color in the background as i said if the lecture hall is dark then it has to be a dark background if the lecture hall is lit up it has to be a white background so these are something very very important because the audience if they can't read your slide then they would get very very bored also the font you know it should be 24 ideally maximum 32 or 36 it cannot be bigger than that and the title has to be maximum 60 point it can't be bigger and most important please do not have all capitals if you have your slide is all capitals nobody can read anything ever we feel that making something in capital is more attractive people be able to look it but you cannot really see it and there are certain fonts which are not to be used so times new roman though it looks extremely professional and extremely good basically it has been seen that it actually distracts people and they can't really read it properly and try to stick to one font in a slide maximum two fonts don't have more than two fonts again it just confuses people and don't have useless pictures you know because the thing is that you feel that you're making it funny but unnecessarily the attention is going to the picture from your content and uh, the most important point which i actually always do is that our lecture has to be such that the audience should feel that the talk was tailor made for the audience we went out of our way to find out what they wanted and we delivered it to them and this is the best way to make them feel special and get our importance and respect thank you thanks samita thank you wonderful points you know we were wondering about the white paper is uh, dr krishna's idea to come out with the white paper and i think we've got enough content here recorded to come out with a few white papers about how to do a meeting and i think one last point i'll make before we finish off we've run out of time is that to have good speakers to do good meetings it is about giving opportunities to speakers to speak on a platform and i think i would like to applaud cci for doing that i think cci has given opportunity to multiple speakers many speakers over the months and years which has increased our faculty strength throughout the country so that's a big salute to cci for having done that day in and day out and today we have speakers faculty who are capable of delivering lectures not just in the country but outside so that's i think something important give opportunities to new faculty to youngsters to come forward on virtual platforms on physical platforms hybrid platforms to speak because otherwise you're never going to get good meetings like you had hopefully had today so thank you i thought we'll never manage one and a half hours actually we have run out of time and badly so and maybe we could have had another one and a half hours so a big thank you to amita prashant sonam shivani vijay and the entire audience who's logged in today i am told that 1918 logins today so thank you to everyone who's logged in and listen hopefully had some nuggets of information which you will find useful going forward a very good night from all of us to all of you in cci thank you yeah. thank you and thank you cci thank you very much yeah, thank you raja for excellent moderation brilliant and thank you my awesome colleagues for making me learn so much yeah yeah raja thank as you, always hi dr krishna thank you program shivani thank you vijay thank you very much thank you sir thank you raja dr raja thank you amita ma'am thank you dr vijay dr sonam and uh, of course the technical team of uh, cci and of course the backbone of cci the entire organizing committee thank okay you, thank you, thank you uh, raja bhai sonam prashant bhai shivani amita ma'am okay we had a wonderful discussion okay yes, i would like to thank cci this is actually my first cci meeting and uh -huh. very very warm discussion to the panelists and everyone good night good, good night, night.